Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Oh, so many announcements today. Uh, the first one you saw as you came into the door that we're uh, recommending our face coverings once again. And if you do not want to be disappointed, do not watch the transmission rates of the North East Tesla. More upbeat news. A few things that we have on our announcement sheet. First of all, we continue our prayers for the Kensier family. Uh, we sent out an announcement last week that David Kensier did pass away. So the family is processing that, that loss and moving forward on a life without David. Some very sad news for Jen and Wayne Adams. Uh, Jennifer's brother, Justin, passed away quite unexpectedly on Friday. And we are in the process, we, what I mean by we is the community, are helping them to raise funds for the funeral. They need to, because apparently funerals aren't free, I didn't know that. So we've set out a basket, if any of you feel so inclined to just put uh, some free will uh, offering in there to help sort of help them get towards meeting those uh, those expenses. I, I would greatly appreciate that, and I know that they would as well. Continue to lift up Roger and Virginia Dran on our prayers, Owen Dedman. Uh, Owen is continuing to make progress. He says that the treatment routine that they have him on right now is, is looking is looking good. He's, he's feeling encouraged. Marilyn also uh, sends her regards to each and every one of us, saying that uh, she's adjusting more into her her new treatment routine, uh, you know, getting adjusted to the new medications. Hopes to be with us in the coming weeks, but right now just still wants to get her, her strength back up. So thank you, Mike and Jackie, for being able to be with us in a musical capacity again. Did you want to give an update on the fun friends helping friends? It was a good turnout. Um, I think we did quite well. They haven't verified the money yet. Okay. But there were three people that helped with and the came supplies. All right. Uh, scratch the Bible study off on the list that's been that's in suspension right now until we come up with a new, new curriculum and then we'll resume that. Ecumenical Council on 916 at Maggie's to discuss fall services and other activities that we do in our community. And then of course ongoing community events that we have here on, on this list. The one that I want to highlight which isn't on here but the annual hog roast that Shepherd of the Hills does, with much uh, careful thought and prayer, they have decided to suspend that for this year. So this is a letter from the head of the program the director telling them that in their fiscal year of 2020, they were able to serve 84 families, a total of $8,500 of emergency assistance, and they also served 57 families over ten thousand dollars of items this year, and they still have five months left in twenty twenty one. So they want to thank each and every one of us with our support of the Shepherd of the Hills ministry to help them accomplish their needs of meeting the concerns of the community. It certainly sure, does take teams for everyone pulling pulling together to meet these goals. And lastly, I think if if I heard this correctly, the Hatteries will be celebrating 69 years of marriage at the end of this week. <laughs> A goal for all of us to shoot for. See Don and Mary Lou for notes. <laughs> Are there any other announcements that we would like to lift up today? Okay, if not, then... Um,
God be with you. Let us pray. O God, because without you we are not able to please you, mercifully grant that your Holy Spirit may in all things direct and rule our hearts. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. I invite you to rise as you are able and join in our opening hymn number 430.
morning, everyone. Old Testament reading is from Isaiah chapter 50, verses 9, 4 through 9a. The Lord God has given me the tongue of the teacher, that I may know how to sustain the weary with a word. Morning by morning, he wakens, wakens my ear, to listen as those who are quiet. The Lord God has opened my ear, and I was not rebellious. I did not turn backwards. I gave my back to those who struck me, and my cheeks to those who pulled out the beard. I did not hide my face from insult and spit. The Lord God helps me, therefore I have not been disgraced. Therefore I have set my face like flint, and I know that I shall not be put to shame. He who vindicates me is near. Who will contend with me? Let us stand up together. Who are my adversaries? Let them comfort me. It is the Lord God who helps me, who will declare me guilty. This one comes from James chapter 3, verses 1 through 12. Not many of you should become teachers, my brothers and sisters, for you know that we who teach will be judged with greater strictness. For all of us make many, mis excuse me, many mistakes. Anyone who makes no mistakes in speaking is perfect, able to keep the whole body in check with the fire. If we put bits into the mouths of horses to make them obey us, we guide their whole bodies. Or look at ships, though they are so loud, large that it takes strong winds to drive them, yet they are guided by a very small rudder, wherever they will of the pilot direct. So also the tongue is a small man, yet it boasts of great exploits. How great a forest is set ablaze by a small fire, and the tongue is a fire. The tongue is placed among our members as a world of iniquity. It stains the whole body, sets on fire the cycle of nature, and is itself set on fire by hell. For every species of beast and bird, of reptile and sea creature, can be tamed and has been tamed by human species, but no one can tame the tongue. A restless evil, full of deadly poison. With it, we bless the Lord and Father, and with it, we curse those who are made in the likeness of God. From the same mouth come blessings and cursing. My brothers and sisters, this ought not to be so. Does a spring pour forth from the same opening, both fresh and brackish water? Can a fig tree, my brothers and sisters, yield olives or a grapevine figs? No more can salt water yield fresh. Please rise for the gospel. And the gospel for this morning comes to us from Mark chapter 8, verses 27 through 38. Jesus went on with his disciples to the villages of Caesarea Philippi, and on the way he asked his disciples, Who do people say that I am? And they answered him, John the Baptist, and others said Elijah, still others said one of the prophets. He asked them, But who do you say that I am? Peter answered him, You are the Messiah. And he sternly ordered them not to tell anyone about him. Then he began to teach that the Son of Man must undergo great suffering, be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the scribes, and be killed, and after three days, rise again. He said all of this quite openly. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But turning and looking at the disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan, for you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. He called the crowd with his disciples and said to them, If any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves, take up their cross, and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake and for the sake of the gospel will save it. For what will it profit them to gain the whole world and forfeit their life? Indeed, what can they give in return for their life? Those who are ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation of them the Son of Man will also be ashamed when he comes into the glory of his Father with the Holy Spirit. Let us pray. Beloved, most merciful God, giving you thanks for this day. As difficult as the weekend has been, as we remember the 
20 year anniversary of the Trade Towers and all the turmoil that brought not only to our nation, but to our own individual lives. Many individuals whose lives were lost, of course, all of the ensuing calamity that followed in those decades. I suppose it's not difficult for us to find ourselves already two decades removed from that incident. But as we present ourselves to you today, not only do we hold remembrance of that moment, that moment in time, which changed the trajectory of our nation and of our lives, but we also think about what lies ahead and how you are calling us to be your witnesses of light and love in a world sometimes reluctant to want to embrace these concepts. Help us to be your people, to be consistent, to hear, to respond. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So in one of the commentaries that I was, was reading about James, the, <laughs> the author was recounting a time when he had mentioned to a mentor of his, he goes, I think, I think this week I want to preach on the James passage. And to which his mentor replied, who are you mad at? Because when you look at the passage today, and James doesn't hold back with the whole third chapter, James is very, thoughts lead to actions. Actions have consequences. And as we've been moving through the book of James, we realize that James wants to impress upon people that it's, he's, he's like, it's, I'm glad that you have faith. It's wonderful. I think you should. But how is the world going to know the impact and the efficacy of your faith if they never come into contact with its, with its fruit? If they hear you speak and proclaim about the wonders of Christ and the many mercies of what God has done, but yet never become the recipient of your forgiveness, never become the recipient of your affirmations, how are they going to know that what we learn or instructed in the scriptures is actually stuff that we've taken to heart. So James's issue is not that people are to not have faith, or that they should only be concerned about deeds. He wants to see a balance between both proclamation and the actual implementation of the things that we proclaim. But I would say that rubber hits the road here in the third chapter, and I'm mindful of those of you who have been uh, teachers and instructors in various forms. And this is not a, this is not a slam on, on those who have who, been instructing because whether you have taught and instructed professionally or whether we mentor and teach one another both from the rearing of children to the mentoring of people in our community, we are all in a capacity in which we are conveying some aspect of wisdom from our own life and lived experience to another, who, who hopefully can benefit from that. James's concern about the household of faith is that we be mindful of the things that we say. Now, we have known, just from life experience, that it is easy to get baited into criticisms, into negative speech, into depressing talk, into angry talk. It's, I mean, this is this is the stuff of of the break room. This is the stuff of life around the water cooler or the or the local tavern. These, I mean, this is to be able to to speak about what's not right in the world or what someone else is doing and they shouldn't be doing. I mean, this is the building blocks of, of society. We we just we know that. So when we run into when our lives in the reality of the world which is we like to often express our displeasure in words, sometimes in deeds, but definitely in words. So when the reality of our life comes and intersects with the gospel, it says that we can do better and that we are called to improve upon that. Where do we go for the example of how best to live? I mean, yes, we can go to the gospels because we see that Jesus constantly was interacting with individuals who had something to say 
about what he was doing, and it was rarely pleasant. Why do your disciples eat with unclean hands? Why do you consort with sinners and tax collectors? Why do you forgive sins away from the temple? Why do you claim that you were the Son of God? I mean, it seemed like Jesus was always constantly fielding his critics. But he did not recriminate. When he dealt with them, he still dealt with them with love because he knew that these were individuals that still had the capacity of being able to, to learn. And they were not going to be brought back by ill speech or vindictive speech, but what they'd be brought back by love is, is loving speech which leaves room to hear the other individual, but also gives them new things to consider. So James is speaking to this, this community that he was writing for. It's like, let's think about the power that we have just in speech. Because so often, and I think that we've created a double standard in terms of harsh words and harsh deeds. I think and I don't need to take a poll on this, but I think many of us would equate harsh speech with lesser weight than harsh deeds. And we do this because we buy ourselves some wiggle room. We say, well, I, I didn't strike them. Right? I didn't raise a hand against them. I just raised my voice and told them I was disappointed and, and it kind of just went from there. So we have this sense in which which we feel like somehow the raised voice, the harsh words, the, the, the profane language is, is far less than, than us actually just taking these two hands and putting them neatly around someone's throat. So we do this because we want to absolve ourselves and say, why didn't it violate And so often we find when we if any of us have ever dealt with individuals who have come from traumatic backgrounds, we find out that speech is exceedingly corrosive. Harsh speech, harsh words, words that are constantly said, words that don't elevate, words that are not designed to elevate, words that are only designed to demean, words that are only designed to, to destabilize and to erode the character of an individual. These things accumulate. And they can land harder than blows. But both are in cities. Both nasty and rude speech and, of course, physical altercations. Both are reprehensible, and we should not dabble in these things. So James is taking us to a place where we have to, we have to hear the things we say. Now, we can't always run around with recording devices and say, today, I'm going to start my recorder and I'm not going to, to turn it off until the end of the day. And then I will actually go back and review the tape and find out the things that I said and go, I can't believe I said that. Why did I say that? Can't believe what was said to me. There are laws against recording people without their knowledge. So don't try this one at <laughs> You're going to run a recording. We are actually recording today, but all of you, you're in on the, you're in on the game. But it's, it's an analogy that we should actually carry ourselves through the day where we are mindful of the accumulated words and the accumulated witness that we project to the world. Now, our reputations are still not up to us. Philosophers have written about this. People can make their own assessment of what they think we're doing. But we still have agency and we still have the wherewithal to try to convey ourselves in the best possible light. It may not always be viewed that way, but we can certainly minimize the amount of gas that we throw on the fire. So James is asking us, and he uses these wonderful examples of horse bit bridle, but I'm not a horse person, so this is more of a metaphor for Jackie. She can appreciate that one about bit bridle. And, and actually, there's a sailor's metaphor in here for Mike. My gosh, it's the Sloan Scripture Day. Because <laughs> we have the ship being guided by a, a rudder. And you think about these little, almost unseemly devices that we use to either guide a large animal this way or that way or to slow. And then a ship 
big, massive, huge ship. If any of you have ever been to Coronado Island in, in Southern California, that's where there's a naval base there. And you see these, these, these aircraft carriers. Aircraft carriers, are just, they, they blow your mind that something of that massive size can, first of all, that it can be seaworthy, right? And then it can move around and be guided by what would otherwise, I mean, it's probably a very sizable rudder, but compared to the rest of the vessel, it's inconsequential. Yet with the, the piloting system that they have on these things, it moves the vessel one way or another. So James is likening these devices to the power of our speech, to the power of our tongue, to be able to frame words that can build up a community, that can fashion individuals who now feel like they have, they have self-worth and dignity and that they are needed, or we can break them down, dismantle them. Each one of us has our own audience. And you may not have thought about that, and you may not actually think about that because you're like, well, I'm not a teacher, or I'm not in the work world anymore, or my children are raised and gone on and raising their own kids. Who's my audience? We all have our own audience. We all, we all have our own sphere of people who are greatly influenced by what we do and what we say. Lives have been transformed by the direction and the wisdom that we have conveyed to others. Now, amongst that audience are individuals who have also been at various times recipients of our disappointment in maybe none too friendly terms. And maybe we've had the opportunity to go back and to apologize for things that we have said in the heat of passion. Maybe the apology is still forthcoming. The fact of the matter is, is that we realize that, that when we are given the ability to convey to others our ideas and our thoughts through speech, we have to be mindful of what we want to convey and what we think is in the best interest of this relationship that we want to advance. Now, James's whole argument is about advancing the claims and the cause of Christ. And he says it's just not good for people who are going to be a biblical witness to be out there trash talking one another. He's like, it's bad for the institution. Yet that is still a memo that many church people within our congregation and within Christendom throughout its history have yet to learn. It's a slow lesson to learn because it is so easy to be baited into critical speech. But it doesn't mean that we should just gloss over where James is trying to take us. James is not saying, don't say anything. James is not saying, don't have ideas, don't have thoughts, don't hold one another accountable. He's like, can we find ways to do this where it's constructive instead of destructive? I think that's what James, this is what James is saying to me. James is saying, by all means, make sure that we still have standards of conduct, make sure that we can all sort of buy into a common practice, but don't do it in such a way to where after you've dressed the person down, they don't feel like living anymore. There has to be some way that we can convey the kind of world we want to live in without debilitating the people that we have to live in this world with. At this point, we are all too familiar with divisive speech. We have all gotten an unofficial PhD in divisive speech, not because we are ardent practitioners of it, but we have seen it play out in the past few months at such a degree that I would say that we're all fairly well studied up on. And we have seen how the divisive speech has led to physical altercations, scuffles in the street, destruction of property and the loss of life. These are people's friends and neighbors, sons and daughters, mothers, fathers, brothers and sisters, individuals that could very well work at you at your establishment. People that you would have to your house for a meal or for a barbecue. Individuals that you would see who maybe even 
have traveled once or twice to communities where you live. Individuals who seem like they would have no spice in them at all until you get them on an issue of great concern. Then it becomes an issue to live or die. Now the church is, the church universal has, we've dropped the ball over the ages because we've jumped into the fray. Various congregations have jumped into the fray, taking sides, doubling down on, on certain types of, uh, shall we say, notions. We haven't, we haven't improved the landscape. So James is coming to us at a very appropriate time, I know, because this is the season of election year which James is supposed to get to us. But James is basically saying, time out. Let's take a moment to think about these notions that we are holding. Let's take a notion to think about these passions that we are feeling. Let's take a notion to think about these relationships that we are called to preserve and ask ourselves, what's the best way to preserve this relationship so I will have this person as a friend, an ally, a confidant, hopefully in the weeks and the months to follow? What do I need to not say or to say differently so we can partner together and move and advance the, the will and the cause of goodwill to all. That's what, that's what James is asking us to meditate on. This would be a, a wonderful text for, for Bible study. Just, just do the third chapter and think on that because there's so much contained with where James is taking us and so much opportunity for us to reflect on even just the past week of slips of the tongue, moments of passion, of things that didn't have to be said and certainly didn't have to be said the way we said them. We can't get that moment back. We can't ask for forgiveness. We can't ask for pardon. But in the moment when we are saying or hearing something that is unpleasant, that moment is gone to reclaim it. And it's hard to unhear something that's already been said to you. So James, in his own way, is asking us to exercise the appropriate level of self-control. To feel what we are feeling. And then to weigh the considerations of how we need to convey said disappointment in order to continue to keep the bridge established between us and another, and also express, shall we say, improved conduct for our future interactions. Every year, I think every congregation should probably review the letter of James, because it's the only, it's the only book of the Bible that I can think of that actually puts Christian conduct in the nuts and bolts. And he speaks in such he speaks in such plain words that it's very clear where he what he wants us to think about and where he wants us to go. James wants the preservation of the church. He wants the church to be a place where we can go to feel inspired and uplifted and motivated and led forward and encouraged to go out there and bless the world. But he says in doing so, we need to think about our role in the world. We need to think about our role as the, the messengers of Christ. And we need to ask ourselves, is this witness, this, this time, this place, this these words that we are using, these actions, do they reflect what we understand about that man that we know is the Son of God? If we can ask that question, and if we can, if we can answer it in the affirmative, press on. Be a good witness. Go and do what we need to do. But if we say, in this moment right now, I'm probably not being a good witness and we become self-aware of ourselves, we can save ourselves from a multitude of hardship and those who are witnessing that moment. This is how James will end his book in, in about two more chapters. But he realizes that it is the work of the community. 
it is the work of the community to ensure that the, the best possible witness that the church can convey gets conveyed. So that way, if we are in descending life and we're sort of in a valley and a miserable moment and we want to lash out, there's someone else who can sort of come in and say, they don't mean that. They don't mean, they're, they're grieving, they've had a loss. You know, that there's some way to interpret the, the, the harsh words. And hopefully the person who's on the receiving end will understand that, that these words that are coming at us is not a true reflection of who we are, right? Angry speech is not the true reflection of who we are. Angry speech is that moment that we're caught in when we're so caught with the disappointment, we just don't even know how to convey ourselves except with disappointment and rage and a loud voice. But that's not who we are. Jesus constantly reminds us that that's not the sum total of who we are. Now, just a brief word about the gospel, and I'm going to leave this whole thing to your meditation. Jesus tells his disciples, and he asks them, what's, what's the prevailing opinion about who people say that I am? Because he knows there's been, there's been some talk. Because people talk. And he's like, so what are some of the words? What are some of the thoughts? Who do people think I am? And they say, well, some think you're John the Baptist reincarnated. Some think you're Elijah, the great prophet who ascended to heaven in a fiery chariot. Some, some say you're some other prophet. He's like, hmm, interesting, interesting. But, but who do you say that? Peter says, we say that you were the Messiah, son of the living God. And he begs them, don't tell anyone about this. But then he goes on to say that even though that you have proclaimed that I am the Messiah, the son of God, I will undergo persecution. I will be on the receiving end of people's harsh words and harsher deeds. Now, Peter doesn't want to hear this. Peter's like, mm -mm, nope, nope, I didn't quit. Years of professional fishing to run around with some guy who's going to be a loser. Some guy who's going to be crucified. Some guy who's going to be persecuted. Now, Jesus did say he would be raised on the third day, but once, once your mind is captivated by the unpleasant trees, you don't think about there's, there's no silver lining to the cloud. All you see is the cloud. And so, Jesus has to take Peter away because Peter's going off on this rant about, Lord, God forbid it, these things will never happen to you because if God understands you the way we do, God will never allow these things to happen to you. You will not be hurt. You will not be given up. You will not be beaten. And Peter is saying what everyone in the room is thinking. Right? Peter's trying to reverse the situation because, first of all, he doesn't like what he's hearing, and he's pretty sure that his fellow disciples don't like what he's hearing, so he's going to flip that. I'm going to tell you, Jesus, that it's not going to happen to you. Jesus realizes that before uh, Peter causes the others to run away on this tangent, he needs to correct Peter. He needs to, like, stop this in the butt, and he does it with strong words, but he still does it in love. He says, Peter, get behind me, Satan. He calls him Satan. Boy, that's a showstopper. Get behind me, Satan, for you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. So here we have an example of Jesus uh, speaking to one of his closest, nearest disciples, but he's correcting him in love. And when he says, get behind me, he's basically saying, who is the leader of this group? Who is it who's guiding the way? Who is it who is showing you the way? Fall in line. Get behind me and follow me. Don't get behind me because you're beneath me. Don't get behind me because you're less than me. Get behind me because I am your leader and I will show you the way out. I will show you the way through this. Fall in line, be the disciple, and learn from God. Don't set your mind on human things when God has a bigger, greater, more remarkable plan. So we see right here that Jesus can use Harsh words that don't diminish. Peter didn't go, oh, you call me Satan, I'm going to leave. I'm not going to play with you guys anymore. I'm going to go back and fishing. He fell in line. He fell in line and says, the teacher is speaking. I got caught up in things that I wanted to see happen. But if Jesus tells me that it's going to be okay, if Jesus assures me that I will be fine, then I'll be fine. And so will. I invite you to join together in our responsive hymn, number 477.
So, I do not know how many of you took time to watch some of the memorials that they had yesterday for September 11th taking place in Washington, D.C., New York City, Pennsylvania, at the various sites, and of course, in cities, states, and across our country. And actually, there was some international remembrances as well, because there were foreign nationals who, who also died in, in the attack. So I was thinking, we probably should just take some time to process where, where we are at, not in words, but in silence. So if you'll bear with me, let's, let's hold some silence as we reflect on September 11th and the day that really changed the direction of our, of our national and personal life. Let us pray. Most merciful God, we present ourselves to you this morning for the renewal that the hearing of your word and the singing of your hymns of praise for this moment of prayer for the sacrament that will follow. We come before you on the heels of the 20th anniversary of the World Trade Center attack. Four airliners that were hijacked, the lives that were lost, the ensuing fallout both in the loss of emergency personnel, the inhabitants who still experienced and succumb to respiratory diseases as a result of all the debris. The ensuing war that followed continued loss of lives. There's been a lot that has unfolded in these past two decades. At the time the 11th of September rolls around, we revisit try to remember where we were at when we heard the news. Trying to process, even now still, our thoughts as we saw the live feeds of images that we would rather not have in our head at all. And it's not that we're turning away from what is. There are some things that we'd rather not have visuals of. We continue to pray for those survivors of the victims of 9 11, for families still trying to wade their way through their grief, which is at this point in time all too real. Children who never met parents who, who died, never met aunts or uncles or grandparents. A lot of lives cut short. What we hope for, loving God, is that we can learn from these things. We can learn from our own ability and power to, to destroy. And to not want to be in that place. To not, as one pastor said, become the evil we deplore. 
as we move forward, paying respects to lives lost, and galvanizing ourselves for a brighter future for our nation and for the world. Speak to us your words of direction. Speak to us as you did to Peter. Tell us to fall in line, to trust in your leadership and to move us forward. So our words and our deeds would reflect your will and purpose. We come before you today just as we are and ask that you would continue to be with those who are sick and suffering, those who are in recovery, bodies who are mending. Ask that you would continue to bring restoration to Owen Denton. Watch over Roger and Virginia Tran. Marilyn Swanson. Casey Evans. And we grieve right alongside the Kanzier family, the Embus family, as we deal with the, the passing of Justin, who at 27 years of age is gone. I pray for an extra measure of strength solace for the family as they not only deal with the demise of his reasons surrounding his death, the daughter he leaves behind, the plans that they have to make in order to offer him some funeral rites, but all the many unanswered questions that always seem to crop up at times like this. And I do hope that we as a congregation continue to be there for my sister, Jennifer, her family, to guide them through this most difficult, confusing, and, dare I say, angry time. Speak to us your words of comfort and allow us to trust in you as you guide us. We give you thanks and celebrate 69 years of marital bliss, emphasis on bliss, with Don and Mary New Hatter. And we thank you that they can be amongst us as a witness to not only an enduring romance, but the many seasons of life that two individuals can go through over the years and come out on the end with something to show. So we thank you for their life and witness, ask that you would bless them. And uh, we're looking at, you know, big seven zero, so keep them around. Receive the prayers that we set before you today in Jesus' name. Receive these, the prayers of your people, collected and sent unto you. Let your blessing fall upon us as we pray as one. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Of thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the glory forever.
We thank you for your many mercies, for your absolution, and for the renewal that you give to us. Bear us up. Allow us once again, with every measure of our being, to present the best possible witness. Guide us. Nurture us when our witness slips or fails. And allow us to bring that same level of compassion to those also trying to do the best with what they've been given. Thank you for this forgiveness. Amen. We join together in our closing hymn, which is taken from the slim volume of faith. We sing 2184. This is rather a short hymn, so we're going to sing it to you twice just because I really like it a lot. So. <laughs> Thank you. 
And may the Lord bless and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you. And may the Lord look upon you with favor and grant you.